And welcome back to Bengal Bites, your home for real, raw, unfiltered talk about the Cincinnati Bengals and the NFL. I'm your host, Derek. This is episode 20. This is the week 9 preview episode, where the Buffalo Bills come into Paycor Stadium to take on the Cincinnati Bengals this Sunday night. Sunday night football. It's a standalone game. Everybody in the whole country is going to be watching this game. A huge matchup with AFC playoff implications up for grabs. In this episode, we're going to break down all the news that happened throughout the week, talk about some of the big matchups and some of the storylines we need to pay attention to in the game. If you're brand new to this podcast, go back and check out episode zero, where I explained who I am, why I'm making this podcast. Basically, I'm a former college football player, lifelong lover of the game and fan of the Bengals, and I wanted to make a podcast for you to enhance this Bengals season without a whole bunch of ads and other kind of crap in it. On our last episode, episode 19, we talked about how the Bengals traveled to San Francisco and had a huge statement win against the 49ers, where they, the Bengals broke the 49ers' 11-game home win streak and broke Brock Purdy, the 49ers quarterback, eight game. He was undefeated at home, handed Brock Purdy his first home loss. Big win for the Bengals and also a big win for Joe Burrow because it showed that he was truly 100% back or as close as he had been since they had just come off their bye week. That was the thing last week. They had had two weeks to prepare for the 49ers. Now this week is a little bit of a different scenario where Buffalo comes into this game. Their last game was last Thursday night against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, which they won. Tough game, but they get those extra few days of rest, 10 days instead of the seven days that the Bengals have. I don't anticipate that really making a huge difference in this game, but it's just one thing to consider is there's no more rest. There's no more bye week for the Bengals. They have a mini bye, I guess you'd call it, with a Thursday night game coming up later in the season against the Jaguars. But this is going to be a long stretch of games for the Bengals from here on out. Coming into this game, the Bills are 5-3. and three. They are second place in the AFC East division, one game or half a game behind the Miami Dolphins at 6-2. and two. The Bills are kind of up and down. They started off with a weird week one game. That was the game where Aaron Rodgers tore his Achilles tendon, but Josh Allen threw three interceptions all to the same player in that game. They ended up losing... Then after that, they got on the right track. Josh Allen has been playing near MVP level. He lead, Josh Allen leads the league in pass touchdowns. Very few interceptions relatively. Since that game against the Jets, Josh Allen has played a lot better. He's pretty much the MVP for the Bills and their offense. The Buffalo Bills come into this game at a record of 5-3, and three, second place in the AFC East have a game behind the Miami Dolphins. The Cincinnati Bengals enter this game at 4-3. and three. They had their bye, so they have one fewer game played. The Bengals have won three games in a row and four out of their last five games. So after a slow 0-2 start, the Bengals have really started to pick up a rhythm, and the Bengals have really been in a groove lately. And that's mostly to do with Joe Burrow's calf feeling a lot better than it had, and he... He's feeling back in his game. The first few weeks, we hadn't been able to truly see what Joe Burrow's capable of. Now Joe Burrow's not injured. Like he said at the end of the 49ers game, George Kittle was like, wow, Joe Burrow, I didn't know you could run like that. And he was like, well, it's amazing what happens when you're not injured. So Joe Burrow's health was no longer an issue. What is going to be the story in this game is going to be just two good teams going at it. Two MVP contending quarterbacks in Josh Allen for the Bills and Joe Burrow for the Bengals. We did see a little bit of an injury scare for the Bills quarterback, Josh Allen. Last week, he went into the blue medical tent during the game, and they were checking it out because he fell on his right shoulder. Josh Allen's right throwing shoulder, he kind of bruised it up, or maybe it was slightly banged up, but he came back, he finished the game, he sat out practice Wednesday, but he finished this week of practice. He's going to play in this game without any kind of injury designation. But just something to watch. The thing that's strange about the Bills, I guess I'd say, is recently they haven't 
played up to the level of competition. I wouldn't say it's weird because they beat the Miami Dolphins 48 to 20 after the Dolphins scored 70 points on the Broncos. So we're thinking, wow, the Bills are amazing. They just destroyed the Dolphins, who we thought were going to be the next Super Bowl team. But then the Bills lost to the Jaguars, and you're thinking, okay, Jacksonville, they're a pretty good team. They beat the Giants barely. It was not a good, it was 14-9. to Ugly game, and the Giants are not a good team. I don't think they had Daniel Jones in that game. I think they had Terod Taylor playing in that game. So the fact that the Bills didn't just absolutely destroy the Giants, a little bit of a concern if you're a Bills fan. Then they lost to the Patriots, who are terrible. And then last week on Thursday Night Football, they pulled out the win against the Bucks. It was a little bit too or a little bit closer than they would have liked, considering they were playing against Baker Mayfield and not a great Buccaneers team. It's so hard to say. Like they say, it's a long season. Any given Sunday, anything can happen in the NFL. I think to me, the biggest turning point for the Bills season so far was I want to say it might have been week three. They lost their starting middle linebacker or outside linebacker, Matt Milano. I think he was an all-pro or definitely pro bowler, but one of those top linebackers in the league, he had a fractured leg. He's going to be out for the rest of this season. And that was a big loss for the Bills' defense. He is kind of the heart and soul or one of the, the captains of the defense, leaders of the Bills. So since the first three weeks of the season, the Bills' defense has kind of been up and down. They haven't been as dominant as they had been earlier this year. This is going to be a primetime game on NBC starting at 8.20 p.m. this Sunday. For the Bengals, it's going to be a home game, and it's going to be what they call the Stripe the Jungle game. I went to the white Bengal game where all the fans were encouraged to wear white, and it was a whiteout. This is going to be a little bit different. They're going to try to do orange and black stripes by section. So like two sections will be orange and then next to them, the next two sections will be black. It's going to be interesting to see how it looks from the overhead blimp camera and on TV. Hopefully if enough people wear enough of the respective colors, it'll look pretty cool. You know, if it's just kind of like a blurry mix, it won't be that cool. So hopefully everybody gets the memo. If you're in the black section, wear the black. If you're in the orange, wear the orange. It should look pretty cool on TV. But I think just in general, Sunday night, all the I think it's going to be a sellout crowd for sure. It should be pretty good weather. It looks like it's going to be maybe in the mid-40s by the time the game kicks off because it will be at night. So the sun's not going to be out. And hopefully there's not going to be any rain or snow or anything like that. But it, hopefully it'll be a clear, crisp night. Good night for football. As we know, the Bengals are coming off their big win against the 49ers at San Francisco. So the casinos, maybe they're giving the Bengals a little bit of an edge, thinking they're hot, and the Bills haven't really been playing that well recently against some lackluster competition. Bengals are favored, depending on where you look, by between 1.5 and 2.5 and points. And they are the home team. Home teams get a few points of an advantage so maybe they'd say on even footing, the Bills would be a slight favorite. If you look on ESPN for whatever that's worth, their analytics metrics say they're predicting the Bills are going to be 67% chance to win. So two-thirds for the Bills, according to ESPN. The over-under, according to the casino betting on this game, is 50 and a half points. That's pretty high, you know, 25 points roughly for each team would be a pretty high scoring game in the NFL especially with defenses this season so tough so we'll have to see and it could be because the Bills have one of the most high powered prolific offenses in the league in terms of yardage and scoring and most of that's to do with Josh Allen but also they have Stephon Diggs so the Bills are probably going to put up a lot of points and also because the Bills defense is a little bit down this year and the Bengals offense is starting to pick it up a little bit the Bengals have had one of the weakest offenses in the league but maybe because Joe Burrow is starting to get more healthy T Higgins is coming along they've already got Jamar Chase Joe Mixon's starting to look good maybe they're thinking okay this could be a high scoring affair 
even though these two teams are not that far apart geographically, they don't play each other that often because they're in different divisions. The all-time series between these two teams, Buffalo leads the series 17 to 16. Pretty close overall. Only one game separates these two. So the Bengals, if they win, they could get it back to even between them. Even though these two teams don't play each other that frequently, they do have a long history. To me, one of the most significant pieces of history is the legacy of the no-huddle offense. The Bengals and Sam Weish had initially, I guess they could take credit for revolutionizing the no-huddle offense, and they made it popular in the late 80s, and especially in 1988. Nobody could stop Boomer Esiason. and that was his MVP season. A lot of teams were protesting, saying that the no-huddle offense was unfair because it didn't give the defense a chance to substitute. And they have since changed some of the rules now. You'll see like referees trying to jump in and stop the center from snapping it to the quarterback because if somebody comes onto the field from the offense, then the defense has to be allowed to substitute a player. I guess when the Bengals were doing it, if they never substitute anybody in from the offense and just keep going up to the line of scrimmage defense has to stay out there and that was something that was successful later for the buffalo bills with jim kelly that's why they went to so many super bowls in a row they went to four super bowls in a row in the early 90s and the buffalo bills lost every single one of them and i was heartbroken as a kid uh, i was rooting for the bills because my mom was a, from buffalo her family was all Bills fans, and I was like, oh, cool. You know, I'll root for this team. They seem pretty good. They go into the Super Bowl every year, and they lost every year. But they ran this no-huddle offense that they basically stole from the Bengals. Let's get it right. But right, moving into more recent history, the last time these two teams met was in the AFC Divisional Playoffs last year. Bengals went into Buffalo on a snowy night and won 27-10. Joe Burrow had two touchdown passes. Joe Mixon was running the ball all over the place. We even had Jackson Carmen in there. That was the, that was back when all of the linemen for the Bengals were getting hurt, it seemed like, every game. Jonah Williams blew both of his kneecaps off. He was in an interview, I think it was on the Bengals Booth podcast with Dan Horde. He talked to him, and he said now his kneecaps are reinforced and stronger than ever apparently his kneecaps or his knees were too flexible before or something that made it so his like kneecaps were flying off everywhere i don't know but he got them reinforced he said they're locked in there tight not going anywhere anymore and that's apparently it's worked out because jonah williams has turned into a godsend for the Bengals. he's been the best right tackle they've had in at least five years if you think i mean they had well, L. Collins was there for most of last season. He was pretty terrible. They had a bunch of random people like Isaiah Prince and Hakeem Adeniji and Bobby Hart was playing right tackle for a good portion of time. It has not been good for the Bengals at that position. So having Jonah Williams there, hopefully he can stay there. You know, they Dan Horde asked Jonah, how does he feel about playing right tackle? He was like, well, I'll play you know, or wherever they need me. Basically, it's going to come down to money at the end of the season. Where can he sign? Can other teams sign him at left tackle or right tackle? Basically, it's going to be like however much money they want me to play. He could probably play center if they want to pay him $25 million. He doesn't care. The point I'm trying to get at here is the Bengals' offensive line this year is much improved on what it had been last year. Last year, Joe Burrow was running for his life almost every game, especially when we got to the end of the season. It was Joe Burrow trying to put the team on his back and will the team to victory, even when they had a bunch of backups out there. This time, Bengals are pretty much at full strength. They're as, you know, as good as you're going to get halfway through the season. They haven't had any critical injuries yet, knock on wood. But as we know, injuries are a part of the game. Hopefully, there's no injuries in this game. But as we know, last year, Year, I guess it's not technically the last year, it's January of 2023, but last season, the Bengals and the Bills were supposed to play in Cincinnati. The game got off to a start, but it was postponed after Bill's safety, DeMar Hamlin, suffered cardiac arrest on the field. They had to perform CPR in front of the fans, and it was a really a strange, bizarre 
situation. They got him in the ambulance, took him away. Nobody knew what was going to happen. After a lot of hand-wringing and deliberation, they finally called the game off. But since then, nobody's given a really clean, clear answer about what actually happened. There was obviously some people who wanted to continue playing the game. Some people thought that they shouldn't continue playing the game. There were a lot of people watching on television. So the league was in a weird situation where it's like, okay, we've got all these people watching this big matchup. Do we want to really stop and cancel the game? It's unprecedented to just stop a game in the middle of it. But that's what they had to do. This week, obviously, this is the first time that the Bills have come back to Cincinnati. So all the reporters are asking all the players about it. And they are really downplaying it, which I totally understand. As a player, you don't want to have that scenario in your mind when you're going out there trying to play. You don't want to think about what happened last year. That was a a terribly tragic incident that I think everybody would prefer to just kind of move on from at this point. So they keep asking like, oh, do you think they're going to have a ceremony before the game? Like, no, I don't think, I think we're just going to go out there and play the football game and not talk about it. And that being said, DeMar Hamlin has been inactive, not even dressed for most of the games for the Bills this season. So it doesn't really seem appropriate to make a big fanfare out of the fact that this guy, but it's, I mean, it's obviously terrific and amazing that he's able to come back, still be on the team, you know, in the calendar year where he almost lost his life. But beyond that important storyline, probably the biggest secondary storyline in this game is going to be the, you know, it's going to be billed as the battle between Joe Burrow and Josh Allen, the two quarterbacks. Like I said, it's, it's almost, they're going to market it as if these two quarterbacks are going to go out there at the start of the game, 50-yard line, bare knuckles, start punching each other in the face. <laughs> Because that's what they would make it seem like. They're gonna that's on the marketing on all the commercials as they're gonna have those two guys facing off against each other like it's a boxing match one on one. No, this is a team sport, team game. So it's Bills defense against Joe Burrow, Bengals defense against Josh Allen. And it's gonna be interesting to see how the two teams and how the two coaches match up. That's the thing that's different about the Bills and the Bengals. The Bengals obviously have Zach Taylor, who is an offensive-minded coach and play caller. In contrast, the Bills, Sean McDermott is their head coach. He's a defensive coordinator and head coach. So he's scheming up the defense. So it's going to be the two head coaches' schemes going against each other. Bengals offensive head coach versus Bills defensive head coach. Then on the other side of the ball, it's going to be Bills and Ken Dorsey as their offensive coordinator going against Lou Anarumo and the Bengals' defense. It'll be interesting to see how they match up. Last week, we saw the Bengals come out with a lot of five-man, five defensive linemen up front to match up with the big personnel that the 49ers ran. Bills don't run that type of personnel. They're more of a traditional 11 personnel, one tight end, especially because their star or their, their primary tight end, Dawson Knox, is on injured reserve with a wrist injury. Their rookie tight end, Dalton Kincaid, is going to have to step up in his absence. And he has done a great job. Dalton Kincaid was a first-round pick. He went 25th overall. He's number 86 for the Bills. And that was just a few picks before the Bengals were able. He was probably on the Bengals' board. Like, if he had fallen to the Bengals in their first-round pick, they probably would have had an eye on him. But Dalton Kincaid, he's had 60 yards receiving in each of the last two games, and he also scored his first touchdown last week. We know that receiving tight ends have given the Bengals some problems. George Kittle tore up the Bengals over the middle last week, especially the safeties. And we're going to have to get the Bengals' safeties. Either Nick Scott or Jordan Battle and Dax Hill are going to have their hands full with the Bengals' receivers, including Stefan Diggs, of course, he's their leading receiver, but they've also got Gabe Davis, number 13, Khalil, Khalil Shakir, number 10. Bills also have a dangerous running back in number four, James Cook. That's Dalvin Cook's younger brother. James is in his second year. He's got 486 yards, 4.8 yards per carry, only one rushing touchdown. But he's been a big contributor for them. 
in terms of the running game on top of Josh Allen. Josh Allen has that kind of, he's almost got 200 yards of rushing himself. He's the second leading rusher for the Bills, but it's, it's the same thing where James Cook is the leading rusher for the Bills and their quarterback, Josh Allen, is the second leading rusher. For the Bengals, it's a similar situation where Joe Mixon, their running back number 28, is the leading rusher. He's got not quite, or very similar stats to James Cook. And Joe Burrow is the Bengals' second leading rusher. But Joe Burrow has like a quarter amount of Josh Allen's rushing yards. Like Joe Burrow has about 50 yards of rushing, and he's the Bengals' leading rusher for the season. So that just tells you how limited the Bengals' running game is in terms of it's Joe Mixon, and that's about it. Travion Williams, I think, has like 25 yards for the whole season. Chris Evans might have 12 yards. Like, if Joe Mixon, let's not even talk about Joe Mixon going down, but if they lost Joe Mixon, I don't know what they would do. The Bengals would be in serious trouble without Joe Mixon right now. So it's Joe Burrow is definitely the MVP, but Joe Mixon is also keeping things afloat. It's kind of crazy when you think about this offseason. Some people were talking about getting rid of Joe Mixon. They're like, oh, Joe Mixon's got this salary. We should cut him, get somebody else in here. They're talking about getting Dalvin Cook in here instead of Joe Mixon. And Dalvin Cook is like on the bench for the Jets right now. So I think keeping Joe Mixon at a lower salary was definitely the right way to go. I'm glad that Joe Mixon took the lower salary. I'm sure the Bengals are happy. And everybody is happy that Joe Mixon is playing better than he's played in years. Hopefully next year he'll get a a contract extension that sees him stay around for even longer. But speaking of contracts, as I mentioned last week, Bengals did not do anything at the trade deadline. They didn't make any moves. Bengals, the only moves they ever make is if somebody is disgruntled, they will trade them in order to get some value back and be like, all right, just get out of here and let's recoup some value with a trade pick or something like that. So Carlos Dunlap, they traded him to the Seahawks just to get him out of the building because he was just being a complete nuisance to the team. And it's addition by subtraction for the Bengals. But they didn't pick anybody up. They didn't get any tight end help or any running backs or anything like that. What they did do was they elevated, or I should say, they signed their tight end Tanner Hudson off of the practice squad to the active roster officially. So they had elevated him for a couple games. He got in for the Rams game and had a couple long catches but he had always gone back and reverted back to the practice squad. Now he's like officially a member of the active roster. And in doing so, that freed up a, another spot on the practice squad. So they brought back a familiar face, linebacker Clay Johnston. He was the one who had like 20 tackles in the preseason game. I don't know why he wasn't in training camp this season or not on the team. I don't think he was on any roster. Maybe he was just injured or something i'm not sure but all of a sudden out of nowhere clay johnson returns it'll be interesting to see akeem davis gaither has been battling injury he's supposed to have a chance to play he's questionable for this game but for the bills they have been pretty active throughout the season mostly or somewhat because of injuries that's the thing is the bengals you could say have the luxury of not needing to make a lot of moves in the season because they feel like They're good with the roster that they have, that they went into the beginning of training camp with for the most part. And because they haven't had any injuries, no real reason to change it up too much. The Bengals are very conservative with their roster. It feels like they will stick around with, I'm I'm thinking about like guys like Tyler Shelvin, who like, how did that guy even last more than like two months? But he made it around for like multiple seasons on the Bengals, even though he barely even played. But the Bengals are very loyal to players. Even when there's like better guys just walking around on the street, Bengals are like, nope, we don't want that guy. He's not in our system yet. But anyway, the the Bills, they made a trade for cornerback because they had been down. Tredavious White, their Pro Bowl cornerback, tore his Achilles tendon. And then Kair Elam, their first-round draft pick last year at cornerback, he is on injured reserve with a hamstring injury, I think it is, but some kind of lower body injury. He hasn't really played that much this season. So they got Rasul Douglas. They He may actually end up starting in his first week on the team. And But at safety, 
they've got some veterans there, Jordan Poyer and Micah Hyde. Safeties who have been playing at a high level in the NFL for a long time. It's su surprising. I went and looked. They're both 32 years old. I didn't realize they were that old. Some old safeties out there. But I was watching one of the Bills preview shows, and they talked about what kind of defense the Bills have been playing lately. They went a lot of dime defense, meaning a lot of defensive backs. So they have those two safeties, and then they'll bring an additional safety on, Taylor Rapp, who used to play for the Rams. And they'll play dime defense. So instead of having multiple linebackers, like instead of Dorian Williams, number 42, who's a rookie and is kind of still getting a little bit of his feet wet in the NFL, they may replace him with another safety. And that may work out for the Bills better because if the Bengals, they don't really have a threat at tight end that other teams need to worry about. Other teams on defense are worried more about the Bengals receivers and stopping Joe Mixon in, in the run. Bengals tight ends are mostly blockers. I would say if I were a defense, it might make sense. It might work out better, but you never know. Like That may put the Bengals in an advantage for the running game if the Bills try to go with a lighter defense. It'll be a chess match back and forth, as these games always are. There's no easy blowout games, for unless you're like Urban Meyer and you have no idea what you're coaching in the NFL. <laughs> the Bills defense may be strongest up front. They're getting a decent amount of sacks with their defensive linemen. Leonard Floyd has six and a half sacks. He leads the Bills. Ed Oliver, number 91, is their big defensive tackle. He's got five sacks. A.J. Epinesa has five sacks. He's number 57, coming off the edge. And not to mention Greg Rousseau, who was one of their first-round draft picks, I think, last year. And then Von Miller, who is obviously going to be a future Hall of Famer, He's still coming off of an ACL that he tore last season. Von Miller hasn't made too much of an impact yet, but I would expect as the season goes on, hopefully he doesn't get going against the Bengals. We want to see a nice, you know, take it easy, Von Miller. Don't come back too fast, especially not against Joe Burrow. We don't want to see anything like the Super Bowl. So just nice and slow, Von Miller. This is going to be... A great game i can't wait to watch it's gonna be a long day because the day starts off at 9 30 eastern with the dolphins and the chiefs playing in germany i don't know if i'm going to be able to get up and watch that game and then stay up all the way until 8 30 when the bengals play i may have to catch that one on replay later but there's a, a few big games throughout the day one of the other big games after that is going to be the Seahawks at Baltimore at 1 o'clock. That's one of the bigger matchups. And the Cowboys going to Philadelphia to play the Eagles at 425. That's going to be the big game in the late window. But the end of the day, to cap it all off, Bills at Bengals, Mike Tirico and Chris Collinsworth calling the game on NBC. I can't wait personally. I think it's going to be a great game. It's one of those games we had circled when the schedule came out, these two back-to-back -back 49ers and Bills was really seemed like it was going to be a tough part of this schedule. If they can get two wins in this part of the schedule, that would be amazing. But that's all for this episode. Thank you for joining me. If you made it this far, don't forget to subscribe, give me a rating, all that kind of stuff. Next episode, we'll come back with episode 21 where we do a recap of this matchup. Hopefully it's recapping another big Bengals win at home. If you're going to the game, don't forget orange and black colors. It's going to be pretty cool. Stripe out the jungle. But until next time, I'm going to leave you with a who day and stay hungry for more Bengal Bites. Mm -hmm.